why don't you open your Bible with me this morning to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Ephesians, chapter 2. We've been looking at the book of Ephesians the last few weeks and learning what our blessings in Christ are. We have many blessings in Christ. We're chosen, we are redeemed, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. In the entire chapter one here, Paul describes our spiritual possessions in Christ Jesus, our spiritual possessions, our inheritance. But now he goes from our spiritual possessions to now our spiritual position in Christ. Not simply our possession, but our position in Christ Jesus. What is our position in Christ Jesus? Because here he's described that we have been saved by grace through faith. That God has taken us out of the graveyard of sin and placed us into the throne room of glory. He's taking us out of the grave. How many of us can praise the Lord that today the Lord has taken you out of the grave? And he's placed us in the throne room of glory. But there is a need for reconciliation because by nature we are sinners. But God has a specific way to reconcile us to himself. So as he's finished talking to us about the power of God and the power that works in us and the power that works through us in chapter 1, well, now that same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead over our lives produces a transformation. Today we're going to talk about transformation. The transformation that took place in your life. Another word for transformation that we see in Scripture and how we study now this doctrine of uh, of transformation is the word regeneration. Would you write that down? Regeneration. And the word regeneration means to be born again or to be made new, to be renewed or to have new life. Regeneration. By the power of the Holy Spirit, when we've come to Jesus Christ, we've experienced and are consistently experiencing regeneration through the transforming work of the Spirit in us and through us. Here in chapter 2 and only 9 verses, we're going to see two things. Sin's work against us, number one, and number two, God's work for us. Sin's work against us, and then God's work for us. For us, we've titled today's message, You He Made Alive. Would you write that down? You He Made Alive. Why? Because God this morning is calling you out of that graveyard to spiritual life in His Son Jesus. He's calling you out of the grave of sin, out of the grave of condemnation, out of the grave of guilt into the light that is in Jesus. So we're going to look at Ephesians 2 verse 1. It says this. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when, when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. He raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceedingly riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the possessions that you've given us in your Son. We thank you for the inheritance that we receive, that we are sealed, that we are redeemed, we've been set free. Lord, that you have chosen us with a purpose and a plan. But this morning, Lord, we come because we want to experience the regeneration of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 
Maybe some of us have experienced it and maybe others still need to. But we pray, Lord, that you would transform us, that we would not be conformed, but that we would be transformed. Thank you for your grace that makes this all possible. In Jesus' name, and together we said, amen. Today we talk about your testimony. We talk about the story of God's grace in our lives. And it begins with this, with what he did. Notice, salvation begins with what God did. Notice it says this, and you he made alive. (laughs) Now circle that in your Bible. That's very important, those words, because here Paul is speaking to the church so that they would understand what God has done for them and how it has affected their lives. It has transformed them. Romans 12.1, what did he say? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that what is that perfect and good, acceptable will of God. So here he says, and you, speaking to you personally, this isn't for someone else, this is for you. (laughs) And you he made alive. This is what he did. He gave you spiritual life. In fact, it says, and you are now born again because of him. He made you alive. Now notice this. He had to make you alive because you were spiritually dead. (laughs) And the spiritually dead possess no spiritual life. In fact, he can do nothing of himself. The spiritual dead person that has no spiritual life in them, God must give him or her spiritual life. Here it says, and you he made alive. Notice when we were spiritually dead, we didn't understand the things of God or we didn't appreciate spiritual things. We were spiritually dead. So here from verse one of verse nine, he's gonna give us a panoramic picture. Just think of it this way, of the terrible spiritual condition that an unsafe person has before Christ, the BC days, a life without God, a life separated from God. These are the characteristics. You he made alive because, verse 1 it says, who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Now the Lord had to make you alive. God had to make you alive because you were dead. (laughs) But it says dead in what? In trespasses and in sins. Dead means that you had no spiritual life in you. It was as of the walking dead. (laughs) We were walking around, but we had no spiritual life. We had a carnal ambition, a worldly ambition. Maybe we were filled with the temporary satisfactions and desires of this world, but we never had spiritual life. So it says you were dead in trespasses and in sins. Now I want you to look at that word there in verse one where it says in. Circle the word in there. Because in describes the realm or the sphere of the unregenerate life. The spiritually dead exists in trespasses and in sins. In fact, we are spiritually dead because of our many sins and because of our many trespasses. Now, these two words that it uses here in verse one are important for us to look at. You're dead because of your trespasses and you're dead because of your sins. What does the word trespass mean? It means when you willfully cross the line. When you willfully cross God's boundaries. It means to deviate, to trespass from the right path and to now turn aside and to wander. You've trespassed now. Have you ever been on a road now and then you see a sign that says, no trespassing. There's always that one person that says, well, I wonder what's on the other side. And we start to deviate from the path and wander on our own way. Where it says here, you are dead in sin. You are dead because you've trespassed. You've crossed the line or the now willfully now cross God's boundary. You have deviated from the will of God. So you're dead because you've trespassed. Not only are you spiritually dead because of that, also because of your many sins. The word sins means that you miss the mark of God's perfect standard. Who has sinned? We've all sinned, the Bible says. It's not simply that some have sinned and some others haven't sinned. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, God's standard. We have sinned. 
The word sin in the Greek word is the Greek harmasia. And what does that mean? It means to miss the mark, or in the classical Greek, is used for a spearman. So think of a spearman when he would throw that spear to the target, but he would miss the target. He would miss the mark when he threw the spear. Or, or maybe an archer's term where, where he would grab the bow and, and the arrow and, and, and he would launch it and he would miss the target. Well, that's what sin means, to miss the mark of God's perfect standard. So what is it that Paul here is telling the Ephesians? He says, he made you alive because you were dead. <laughs> and you were dead because you continually trespassed God's boundary. You were dead because you willfully, you knew that you should not go there and you willfully trespassed. It was an act now of rebellion. That's what trespassing means. So your disobedience in trespassing and your sins when you miss the mark made you spiritually dead. Now that word dead, I want you to mark this in your Bible. It means separation. It basically means separation. You were separated from God. Why? Because you willfully disobeyed and because you consistently miss the mark. In Isaiah 52, 59 verse 2, it says, but your iniquities, your sins have separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he cannot hear. What is it that separates us from God? Our sins. Our sin separates us from God. So we were separated from God spiritually because of our acts of rebellion and because of us missing the mark. You see, trespasses speaks of a, a man as a rebel that disobeys willfully. And sin speaks of a man as a failure that consistently misses the mark. So what does this teach us in only one verse? Is that before God, we were both rebels and we were failures. <laughs> Why? Because we had no spiritual life in us. In fact, we were living for the flesh. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul tells the church of Colossians, and he says this, and you being dead in your trespasses, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, you had not cut off the flesh. You were still serving the flesh. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven all of your trespasses. You see, our lives are filled with trespasses, with transgressions, where we willfully disobeyed God, where we consistently miss the mark. The world is one great graveyard that is filled with people that are spiritually dead while they live until they come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And notice this, we have to, Come to him for life. There's so many times that we think, well, you know what? I want to do something for God. I want to live my life for God. Well, I'll tell you this this morning. You cannot live a life for God until you first have received a life from God. You cannot live a life for God until you first have received a life from God. You, he made alive. Why? Because you were dead in trespasses, in sin. This is your testimony here. We were dead and now we're alive because of the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's exactly what happened in our lives. But notice how it says in verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And he's taking us now in regards to why he made you alive. Why is it that God had to do this work? Why did he do it? Because you once walked according to the world. This is your past. He's going to take us to our past without God. He's going to take us to our present, what God has done for us. And he's going to take us to the future plan that God has intended through us. So here he's speaking about a past, the past without God. Just imagine your past without God. Where would you be today without the grace of God? <laughs> Maybe we would not be here this morning. But thank God for his grace that has kept us and we are here in his house receiving his word today. It says here, verse 1, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. The word walked is the word parapateo. <laughs> It's a very interesting word. I love that word because it means to regulate your life according or to now regulate your life or one's self-life according to someone else's behavior. 
or to pattern your life. You once walked according to the world's sins. Here it speaks of three now enemies of the spiritual life. What are the three enemies of the spiritual life? The world, the devil, and the flesh. So when you're walking without God, what was against you? It was the world that was conforming you according to its practices and patterns. Then was also the devil, the devil that came to influence and the devil that came to control. But then it also was the flesh, our sin nature that we were giving unto. So the spiritual enemies that we have are the world, the flesh, and the devil. First he begins now with talking about the world. You once were walking, you were living in sin according to the world's standards, according to the world's program, according to the world's values. And when he says this, he says, you were controlled. You were as the world's slaves. You were disobedient. Not only were you dead, you were also disobedient. Would you take note? Not only were you dead, you were also disobedient, just like the rest of the world. This was the beginning of man's spiritual death. His disobedience, our disobedience to the will of God, our disobedience to the will of God. Why? Because we were being influenced to live according to the pattern of the world. And notice even today, as you've come in, you are either being influenced and you're either following now the values of this world, the patterns of this world, or you're following and you're being influenced by the principles of the word of God. You have to ask yourself, who am I walking with? Am I walking with the world or am I walking with the Lord? Am I walking with Jesus today? Because in this verse here, verse 2, it says you once walked, you you patterned your life according to the world. He's speaking of the old man. The old man that was living according to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now what does the world want to do with you today? The world would like for you to conform to its values. The world would like to manipulate your mind to, to make you believe the deception that it comes with. In fact, what does the Bible say in John chapter 17, verse 14? Jesus, as he's praying to the Father for his disciples, he prays this, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just like I'm not of the world. You're either of the world or you're of the word. We're one or the other. And Jesus said, I'm not of the world, and they, the disciples, are not of the world either. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 The Apostle John says this to the church, do not love the world. Don't love the world. Don't become attached to the things of this world. Do not become enamored with the things of this world, what the world wants to offer you, or the things in this world. Because if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You either are loving the world or you're loving the Father. And he says, you once walked according to, to the pattern, you were a follower of the world, not only of the world, but also of he who controls the world. And you know how he refers to him as the prince of the power of the air. He speaks here of the devil now. You're walking according to the pattern of the world. You're walking in sin, but you were also just going with the flow. That's what it means, according to the prince of the power of the air. You were just a follower. You're going with the flow or the pace or the mindset of that place and that time that you lived in. Notice how he describes the devil here. The prince of the power of the air. Why is he a prince of the power of the air? Because he is the controller. He orchestrates this environment, the air, the world. According to he who controls, orchestrates According to he who now reigns in this realm, this is the devil's domain, the world. Who is it that runs the world? The devil. Why? Because we live in a fallen sin nature. And he says, you one time lived under the reckless guidance, living under the devil's control. Just think about that. When we were lost without Christ, when we were going astray, when we were filled with transgressions and trespasses, living always in sin, we were under the devil's control. Because the world is now controlled by Satan. In fact, Satan, who is the commander of the unseen world, says here, and then it says this, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. 
The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. It is the devil who also has a spirit who works is the spirit of the Antichrist or the spirit of the enemy now who is working in the hearts of those who choose to disobey and rebel against the Lord. In fact, who are those sons of disobedience? Those who refuse to believe in Jesus and those who accept the lie. Those are the sons of disobedience who refuse the truth and accept the lie. They're living in their hearts of rebellion. They're obeying Satan and rejecting the Lord. I like in the New Living Translation, as it translates this verse for us, it says this, in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God, the enemy is working in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. The enemy is working in the hearts of those that refuse to obey God. It's later in Ephesians chapter 6 that he, he warns us to be fully armored with the armor of God that we can fight against the t- tactics of the devil. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, he says, But put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Why? Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So who are we at war against? We're at war against the world and the principles and values and standards, but we're at war against the devil as well. It's spiritual warfare now. And he's telling, there was a day where you lived according to the world. There was a day that you were controlled by the devil, where the devil was working in your heart. There was that day. Not only was the devil working in your heart, but you were also serving the flesh. Let's read verse 3. A day where we were serving the flesh. Notice it says, among whom also we all. Circle the word we all. Because it doesn't mean just someone. It doesn't speak of just a person that you think you know, all of us were serving the flesh at one point in our sinful nature. Everyone is guilty of serving the flesh apart from Jesus. And he describes it there in verse three, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves, speaking about our behavior. At one point in our behavior, we conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Notice what it's speaking about here. We all used to live this way to satisfy the carnal, selfish pleasures. In fact, we were in bondage to sin. We were in bondage to the flesh, and it affected our behavior and our conduct. And what did we do when we were in a, apart from Jesus serving the flesh? Well, we were following our passionate lustful desires, the inclinations of the spiritual nature, we were given over. We were so weak to what the flesh wanted. Whatever the flesh wanted, whatever the mind thought about, that we pursued now. And the carnal, the the fleshy person, the one that's given over to the flesh is incapable of doing God's will. So a life without Christ, notice what it does. It embraces perversions. Embraces, accepts perversions. It accepts the cravings now. These are the works of the flesh. What were we? We were dead. (laughs) Then we were disobedient, but also we were depraved. We were also depraved. Why? Because we were given over to the lustful pleasures of the flesh. And because we were dead, disobedient, and depraved, by nature, notice what it says here, by our sinful nature, we were children of wrath. (laughs) This was our sinful nature. In our sinful nature, you don't have to teach someone to sin. We have sinful nature embedded in us because we live in a fallen world. Do you ever have to teach a little baby to sin, a little, your little precious baby angel? Do you have to teach him to sin? No, you don't. I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old. They remind me every day. No one taught them to sin. They, they'd learn that on their own. (laughs) What's the first thing that they learn to say? This is mine. No. Why? Because it's their selfish human nature now. And by nature, we were children. What does children mean? That we had a close relationship, not with God, but we had a close relationship with the wrath of God. (laughs) By nature, we all deserve the wrath of God. We were subject to God's holy anger, his holy judgment, his condemnation. 
By our own sinful nature, we were just like everyone else. We're born into it. So we were dead. We were disobedient. We were depraved. And then we were also doomed. <laughs> doomed to the wrath of God. Why? Because of the sinful nature of our flesh. Now the flesh reflects, the flesh reflects our sinful nature. That's what it does. It reflects uh, something that does not honor God. It's the flesh. And, and notice, you don't need the devil to make you sin. The flesh may make you sin on its own <laughs> because we live in a sinful nature. Sometimes we say, you know what? I blame the devil for that one. Don't blame the devil. That was you <laughs> in your sinful flesh. I heard a story of a little girl that was fighting with her baby brother and she kicked him and pulled his hair and he was crying. The mom comes around and he says, Sally, why did you let the devil make you kick your brother and pull his hair? He said, well, mom, the devil made me kick him to pull his hair. That was my idea. That's the flesh. You don't need the devil. <laughs> If you think that you've conquered the devil, let me tell you something. You have the flesh as a problem as well. <laughs> you have the world as a problem as well. What are the three spiritual enemies of the Christian believer? The world, the devil, and the flesh. Now, we were born by nature children of wrath because of our sinful nature. But when we reject Christ, when we reject Christ after knowing the truth, and after reaching an age of accountability, today you've all reached an age of accountability. That's why you're here. You can't walk out of those two doors and not know the truth. You heard the truth today. You can't say, well, I didn't know. I'm going to tell you, you know now. You were born as a child of wrath, but when you choose to disobey, you know what? You become children of disobedience by choice. Children of disobedience by choice. First you were a child of wrath, now you become a child of disobedience by choice. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees, the hypocrites, he called them? In John 8, 44, he says, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. He called the devil their father and the desires of your father you want to do. Why, is the de why did he say that the devil was their father? Because they desired to do what the devil wanted. They were serving the devil. They're allowing the flesh now to manipulate and to control the mind and the heart. Ask yourself today, who do you serve? Who do, you, do you serve the flesh today? Are you serving the flesh or are you serving the Lord? You can't serve two masters. You can only serve one because you either every day you make a conscious decision, I'm going to surrender to the old man or I'm going to surrender to the Lord. And we need help. Outside help to do that. That help that we need in order to live for Christ can only come from him. In fact, when you read these verses in verse 3, that, that you were just as others, you were no different. <laughs> Think about it like that when you, it's time for you to show compassion. And circle that word in your Bible, just as others. When you look at someone in their sin, you were just like them. You were just like them. When you were serving the world, when you were serving the devil, when you were serving the flesh. You were just like out them, them. You know what it refers to? A human hopelessness. A human hopelessness that in and of ourselves, we could have not done anything to get us out of that place of sin. No matter what we did, we were in bondage, in slaves to sin. But here now, he's going to go from separation uh, for, with God. We were separated from God now to consecration. Verse 4, from separation to consecration. What does that mean? One day we were separated from God, then the next we were separated for God. Consecration. Consecration means to be set apart wholly for God's use. Separated from God in our sin, then separated for God in consecration. This here is God's work for us. From verse 4 to verse 9, God's work for us. Now say, but God, together. But God. That's exactly what happened. We were in sin. We were in bondage. We were serving now the flesh. We were children of wrath, doomed to the judgment of God. 
but God. <laughs> this is how he did it. With his mercy, with his love, with his grace, but God. It speaks of your personal reconciliation. This speaks of the present. The past was that you were doomed in sin as a child of wrath, but now God has stepped in who is rich in mercy. (laughs) I want you to look at those words and understand that your entire testimony, your entire spiritual walk is introduced in those two words, but God. One day you were lost, but God. One day you were depressed, but God. One day you had no hope, but God. You had a broken marriage, a broken family, but God stepped in. You thought that those doors were closed, that they were never going to be opened, but God. When the world said no, but God said yes. When the devil said no, but God said yes, and he gave you spiritual life. Now notice your salvation begins with the Lord. This is why Jonah in chapter 2 verse 9, what does he do as he cries out from the belly of the fish? (laughs) He says, salvation is of the Lord. He is the Lord of salvation. What does this mean that your salvation began with but God? Your salvation began with God's grace. Your salvation was initiated, was originated by God's love, grace, and mercy. And he describes the nature of God here in verse one. And he says in this verse here, as we read verse four, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, but God who is rich in mercy. What is mercy? It's forgiveness. But God, because he was abounding in forgiveness. That's what mercy means. Because he didn't give us what we deserve. He did not give us the wrath, the judgment, the condemnation. Why? Because of his great love. Notice this. God has mercy for you today. He's not going to give you what you deserve. What do we deserve? We deserve judgment. A lot of people say, well, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this life. Or we want to say, you know what? Just give me what I deserve. We want justice, right? If you want what you deserve, it's judgment, (laughs) A lot of times we talk about justice. Well, you know what? Social justice is social justice, that in a world with a culture screams social justice. What about holy justice? The justice that comes from the judgment and the wrath of God. That's exactly what we deserve. But God, who is rich in mercy, he was abounding in forgiveness. He's willing to forgive you and not give you that which you deserve. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it speaks of this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy. How many of you guys can praise God this morning because God is abundant in mercy towards us? Who is abundant in mercy. What do you do? He has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a living hope because of his mercy. Think about that. You have hope today because of mercy. You have hope today because of mercy. Now, Why did he display mercy? He displayed mercy because of his love. Somebody asked me after second service, but why did God forgive me? Why did God even create me? Because he loves you, that's why. (laughs) Today you need to know God loves you. God loves you, so because he loves you, he displayed, he lavished on you his mercy. And notice that he describes it in verse four, who is rich, abounding in mercy. There is nothing that his mercy cannot cover or forgive because of his great love with which he loved us. Here he's going to describe a few things that God has done for us, three things. Number one, he's loved us. Would you write them down? Number one, he's loved us. He's loved us. And that is the nature of the Lord. Because he loves you, he's willing to show you mercy. That's the character of God. Because he loves you, he's willing to show you mercy. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it says, He who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. <laughs> if you think that you know God, but you never show mercy, you don't truly know God. Because God is a God that's loving, and in his love, he shows mercy. Mercy should not be something only that you expect. Mercy should be something that you also extend. You know the people that you really know who the Lord is? The ones that are loving and the ones that show mercy. Because that's the nature of the love of God. He displayed his love 
to us by giving us, first of all, mercy, what we did not deserve. He gave it to us. You know what mercy looks like? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. Because he loved you, he gave his mercy. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So number one, God loved me. But number two, verse five, he made you alive. Did you write that down? He made you alive. It said this, even when we were dead and trespasses made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. It says, even when. It didn't say when you were the best, he loved you. In fact, it says when you were unlovable, when you were unlovely, when you gave him no reason to love you, even then he loved you. Just think about the, the measure and the extent of the love of God. In Romans 5, verse 6, it speaks of his love. Even when we were sinners, God loved you. Even when you were a sinner, Christ died for you. Romans 5, verse 6, write this down, church. It says, for when we were still without strength, when we were weak in our flesh, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. Just think about that. So very rarely would someone die for a good person, but almost never would someone die for an average person, he's saying. But God demonstrated his own love toward us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was his love. He loved us, so he made us alive. Made us alive means he gave you spiritual life. And now you live a life together with Christ. You have a new life. You've been born again. You've been resurrected. That's what it means. He made you alive. What it refers to now, it puts us in union with Christ by his spirit. This speaks of the present work that God has done for you now. Made alive means he has quickened you by his spirit. It means that he energizes every aspect and work of your life. He made you alive now. He delivered you from your grave clothes. He made you alive. You're dead and now you're alive through Christ Jesus because of his love. It's so amazing to hear the testimonies of transformed lives because you can't argue against a transformed life. Their life has changed. You don't understand why. Why? Because God made them alive. Because God has forgiven them. Because God's grace has covered every one of their sins. It's been the grace of God. It's the newness of life. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says this, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. We were buried with Christ. Notice that. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, just as he was raised from the dead, even so, we should also walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. We are resurrected from death to life. Christ made us alive. Now notice, why? Because we were dead in sin. So oftentimes people think, you know what, I'm in bondage. I, I think I have a problem in my mind. You know what, I, let's call it, you know, just a sickness, you know, and I need help because I'm sick in this area of my life. No, it's not a sickness. Let's call it for what it is. It's sin. And you did not need the Lord to resuscitate you. You needed him to re resurrect you because you were dead. We were dead in our sins. We were buried with him. That's when we get, we get baptized in water baptism. What happens in water baptism? It represents the old man going into the water now and being buried with Christ and then raised to new life to walk in the newness of life, the new life that Christ has given us. Some would say sometimes, well, pastor, would you, you know, I've had a really rough past. Would you just keep me in the water a little longer? It's Christ who has given you new life now. And it says, by grace, you have been saved. Now look at that verse Verse 5, by grace you have been saved. But God, he's rich in mercy because of his great love. By grace you have been saved. It is God's grace that initiated the work of salvation. Notice how he speaks of this. He made us sit together, as he speaks of making us sit together with Christ. As he says, he made us alive together with Christ. See that verse 5 and 6 speaks of our identification, our union with Christ. We were separated, now we're united. Our union with Christ now. I love that word there in verse 4. It says, with Christ. 
verse 4 and 5. Because in Romans 6, Paul has told them, we've been crucified with Christ. We have died with Christ. We were buried with Christ. And here now, in verse 5, we are made alive together with Christ. We have been united with Christ now. Verse 6, and raised us up together. This is now the plan of God's salvation. What did he do? He raised us from the dead along with Christ. He's raised us from a life of the grave. And here it says he raised us up. It means that he set us free. Would you remember that today? He set us free. This is when God set us free. Notice what he did. He raised us up from the dead. And then notice your position in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, this is your position. And made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There it is. Where is it that you sit now? In heavenly places now. You're not sitting in the grave anymore. You're not sitting in your sin. You're not sitting in condemnation. You're not sitting in the grave now. You're walking in the grace of God, sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus together with him. And this is the plan that he speaks of now. He raised you to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now think about what God has done. (laughs) He's taken you from the graveyard into the throne room of God. That's where Christ sits, in the throne room. And now when God the Father looks at you, notice this. Now when God the Father looks at you, you know what he sees? He sees the work of the Son in you. He looks at you with the eyes of compassion. And when he looks at you, he sees the Son, Jesus. He has to look through the cross. And then he looks at you and he says, look, they're seated with my Son, Christ. They're together. They're united. Seated there in heavenly places. In Christ. What do we get to do now? Enjoy fellowship. Identify with him. You know, today, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you don't identify with the world anymore. You don't try to be like the world. You try to impress the world. You don't try to serve the flesh. You're not looking to serve the flesh or or, or looking to serve and controlled by the devil as he's working in the hearts of the sons of disobedience that rebel against God. Notice you identify with the grace of God. You identify with the grace of God. Why? Because grace has victory over guilt. Grace has victory over condemnation. Grace has victory over the grave and sin. There is no sin that you have committed, that we have done, ever committed, that the grace of God cannot cover and cannot forgive. It's God's unmerited favor. In fact, John verse 5, verse 24 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in me, and he who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. How do we pass from death into life? By believing in the grace of God, in the gift that God has given us, which is in his son. Notice verse seven, as we continue reading, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceedingly riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. This is the future plan. This is what God has done. For what purpose? That in his kindness, in his goodness, now he would glorify himself with this plan so God can point to all future generations and use us as examples of his incredible wealth and grace. Just think about it today. As you walk out to the supermarket, to the store with your family, what are you? An example of God's grace. (laughs) Today we're examples of God's grace. That, that if God can save me, notice, he can save you too. That God can reach anyone. That in the future generations to come, verse 7, it says, he may show, he may display through you now the exceedingly richest now of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. To those that are walking in Christ Jesus, what does God do towards us? that are united, that are together with Christ, what does he do? He shows his kindness and he displays his grace to all generations. What is it that we are to do today? Hebrews chapter three, verse 15. If the Lord speaks to you, what does it say today? If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as in rebellion. Don't harden your heart today if you're hearing his voice. Today, God wants to not only love you, he wants to make you alive and also raise you up from the dead. Notice verse 8 as it continues. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. What a beautiful verse. 
God has saved you so that he can use you to display his grace upon. But here in verse 8, it describes that you have been saved by grace. You have been saved by grace, by his love, by his mercy. His grace saved you, for by grace you have been saved. What is grace? Now, if mercy is forgiveness, if mercy means that the Lord did not give us what we did deserve, well, grace means that then he gave us what we didn't deserve. What is that? Salvation. So God loves you. He's abounding in mercy that he was unwilling to give you. He forgave you. He did not give you what you deserved, which is judgment. And then he went above and beyond that, and then he showed you grace, and that he gave you salvation. You know what grace means? An undeserved favor. Grace means favor that is not deserved. It's not just any type of favor. It's a favor that is not deserved. It's love that is not deserved. It's goodness that is not deserved. So this means that salvation completely is a part, is separated from any kind of merit or works on our part. That means you can't earn your salvation. It's unmerited favor. What's the word merit means? The word merit, write this down. The word merit means performance. Your salvation is not based on your performance. Nothing that you can do would make God love you more than we already does. He loves you. He's abounding and rich in mercy. By grace, you have been saved. It's not based on your performance. Your salvation is not based on anything you can do. What is grace? It is everything in exchange for nothing. <laughs> That's grace. Everything in exchange for nothing. Some people will say, you know what? Well, I think I'm going to heaven because I'm good. You go out and you share your faith. Well, why do you think you're going to go to heaven? If today you would die, would you go to heaven or hell? Well, I think I'll go to heaven. Most people would say, well, why is that? Well, you know what? I've never killed someone, never murdered someone. I think I'm a good person, so I'm going to go to heaven. The Bible says, no, no one is good, not one. <laughs> Romans chapter 3. We've all fallen short of God's glory and God's standard. Our goodness does not save us. You can do whatever you want. It doesn't save you. It's, it's by grace through faith. It's trusting now. This is why it says through faith. It's trusting in God's grace and God's salvation. It's trusting in the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. It's grace and faith working together. What is grace? Grace is God's goodness for us. Faith is our response to his goodness. I want to ask you today, have you responded in faith to God's grace today? Have you responded in faith saying, Lord, I trust your work of grace for my life that I am saved. That it's not anything of myself. It's, it's great. It's the same power that saves me. It's the power that keeps me. It's the grace of God. It's a gift of God. In fact, look at how it's, it reads it there in verse 8. Through faith, through you trusting in God, through you trusting in Jesus Christ, grace has made available this gift of salvation so now you can respond in faith, notice, through faith, and not of yourself, it is a gift of God. I want you to underline that in your Bible. Not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. It's not of your works. We don't walk in works. We walk in grace today. <laughs> it's such a blessing that we can walk in grace and not in works. It's a gift of God. What, what's it? It is your salvation. <laughs> your salvation is a gift from God to you. It's a gift. Your salvation is a gift your salvation is not a reward. <laughs> your salvation is a gift. Your salvation is not a reward. Notice, if someone were to give you a gift and they were uh, to give you a car and, and you were so grateful for the car that they gave you and you wanted to give them money in exchange for it, well, that wouldn't make it a gift anymore, right? Because you are looking to pay for it now. <laughs> what he's saying here, no works that you can do would save you. You can say, well, I come to church every Sunday. That doesn't save you. I serve in ministry. I grew up in the church. It doesn't save you either. Well, my mom and dad are Christians and they pray every night. I see them. That doesn't save you either. <laughs> There's nothing that you can do in your own efforts, in your own strength, that would save you. It's the grace of God that saves us. We don't deserve it. It's a gift that we receive by trusting in the work of Jesus Christ. Now notice, he's made it available to us. 
He's made it available to us because of the work completed at the cross. Notice how it says in verse 9, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This is so comforting that we don't have to strive. This is so comforting that we don't have to be ambitious. That we don't have to try to be saved. You know how, what, what, how we are saved today? When we run towards the grace of God, it says, Lord, forgive me. I need you, Jesus. Nothing that I can do will get me saved. I need you, Jesus. I need the grace of God, not of works, lest anyone can boast. It's not your goodness. It's not a reward for the good things that you do. None of us can boast about it. Why? It's for the glory of God. You're not saved because of your self-righteousness. What does the Bible say when it speaks of your, of your righteousness or, or, or that which you have? In Isaiah 64, it says, they're as dirty rags. <laughs> Think about it. The best version of yourself is still not good enough. A lot of people say, you know what? You read these self-help books of today in the culture. You know what? Just be the best version of yourself. I'm, well, I hate to tell you, that's still not good enough. I don't want to be the best version of myself. I want to be the best version of Christ Jesus through me. So notice what it says. Verse 9, not of works, lest anyone can boast. It's not religion, it's a relationship. It's not based off what you do. That's religion. It's based off what you do. His grace is enough, period. His grace is enough. What is religion? Religion is man working up to try to be accepted by God. Religion is man reaching up to God, wanting to be accepted by our own goodness. That's religion. Relationship is what God did when he sent his son Jesus, and he reached down to man when we were helpless and hopeless now, and he gave us a loving relationship because he loved you, because he made you alive, and because he raised you up. What a beautiful work that God has done. Notice what it says, verse 4, his great love. Verse 5, he made you alive. Verse 6, he raised you up. Why? Because of his great love, he displayed mercy and grace in your life. The sufficiency of his grace alone to save you. His grace is enough. You would think to yourself, well, you know what? I, I need more to be saved. No, you don't. All you need is the cross of Jesus Christ. You don't need anything else. No works, no efforts, nothing. Today you need to, need to say, Lord, just give me that favor. Give me that gift that I don't deserve. It is your grace. And there the Lord meets you with his love. So there the Lord meets you with his love. Can we pray?